Welcome. Church family, friends and visitors. If you are new here, we would love to get to know you. Whether you are participating in person or online, please complete a Connect card. When you are here in person, you can find the Connect card in the back pocket of the chair in front of you. Just leave it in the offering plates next to the door when you are leaving. Online you will find the link to Connect card in the upper right or under the three little menu bars on the top left. These will still be available even after the live stream ends. Just be sure to scroll down to the bottom of the card and click on Submit. For those who are online, particularly if you don't type messages in the chat, please use the Connect card to let us know you are here and doing okay. In person or online, the Connect card is a great way to send in questions, comments, or prayer requests. If you know we already have all your connection information, just putting your names is enough. Thanks for helping us to help you. Now let's join together in worship. All right, I'm going to invite you to stand if you can, sit if you need to. These next three songs, um, the theme around them is this reality that uh, life isn't always champagne and roses, is it? We all experience difficult times, and the reality is... Um, God is with us. So two of these old hymns you probably know, When the Morning Comes and um, My Lord is With Me All the Time. The third song is a new one. It has at its, at its root, its base, uh, the theme from a, another um, well-known Christian hymn called It Is Well With Our Soul. So it has that chorus, but it has some other words that I think are really that are really nice and really I important for us to understand. God's with us regardless of what we face. Uh, let me say that one more time. And an amen would be nice. God is with us regardless of what we face. Amen. All right, let us sing. Here we go. Trials talk on every hand, and we cannot understand all the ways that God will lead us to that blessed promised land. When He'll guide us with His eye, and we'll follow till we die, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story how we've overcome. We will understand it better by and by. All our cherished plans have failed, disappointments have prevailed, and we've wandered in the darkness, heavy hearted and alone. But we're trusting in the Lord, and according to His word, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we 
we will tell the story how we've overcome we will understand it better by and by temptations hidden snares often take us unawares and our hearts are made to bleed for some heartless word or deed then we wonder why the test when we try to do our best we will understand it better by and by by and by when the morning comes when the saints of god are gathered home we will tell the story how we've overcome we will understand it better Oh 
trying to find a way how we could reach people with the gospel and also be able to bless the community during the Christmas season. At first, it was just a Christmas event and people would come in and, and get toys and we share with them the gospel. We had about 170 some people come. That was awesome, but I knew God had more to it and we gave it a new name. We called it the Hope Toy Drive. And HOPE is actually an acronym for helping other people everywhere. So the next year we prayed and over 1,500 people came and so many people gave their life to Jesus. And then last year, 2020 hit. We didn't know what we were gonna do. We're like, how are we gonna reach people with the gospel when we can't even go outside? So we did a HOPE toy drive through and 
it actually opened up more than we ever thought. And we were able to share the gospel and bless over 15,000 people. Evangelism is not the finish line. It's more the starting point. We believe in discipleship. And how do we do that is to get them plugged in to a local church. The mission of California Southern Baptist is to resource the vision of the local church. And as churches give to the California Missions offering, the Evangelism and Missions Initiative team is able to take that and resource churches to reach their communities. Through the California Missions Officer, we're able to be able to receive grants, to be able to go get more toys and more things, more ways, more flyers, more opportunities for people to be able to hear the gospel with. And that changed everything. Every day I get to work with churches that are trying to impact lostness. And our assistance gets to help them that much to actually bring about victory. When they may not have had it, trying to do it all by themselves. We need to engage with the families, engage with the people, find out what their needs are so we can share the gospel and be more effective in our neighborhoods and communities. It's not about the toy, that's not the gift. It gives us the hope that we bring to the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our time for corporate prayer. I'm going to uh, start our prayer time and then Brother Ron will close our prayer time. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne, your throne room with you sitting on the throne. Uh, Father, I think when I have that visual image, it humbles me because regardless of what I think about myself compared to you, I don't match up. None of us do. And Father, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Your ways are higher than our ways. And Father, what you've done in creation, how you've acted in the history of this world, in relationships, in circumstances and situations. Thank you, Father, that you would hear us as we bow before you and give you our requests. And Father, you encourage us to do that. And thank you for that. Father, you're not a God who doesn't communicate. You're not a God who's so far out there that we can't know you, as some people proclaim. We thank you for what you do, what you have done, and what you will be doing. Father, I lift up uh, this church body, and I just pray, Father, in the lives of your people, that you would be a real presence, that you would be a source of strength, that you would help them, Father, when the difficult times come, and that you would help them, Father, when the good times are here, to be able to praise your name. I pray for Fast Kids is starting this week. I pray, Father, that you would use it, Father, to bring glory to your name and draw these kids and their families ultimately to church. I just pray again for Pastor Mike and Jane. I pray that you'd watch over them on their vacation. Just give them a safe trip when they come back. Help them to uh, be rested and um, <clears throat> energized. I thank you, Father, for so many people who do so many things. I just ask, Father, that you would encourage and bless them. I pray for the remainder of this service, Father, as we listen to your word. As we pray, Father, I just pray that you'd use those to touch our hearts and minds. And that, Father, as a result of being here with your people, the fellowship that we have with one another, and the presence of your Holy Spirit in us and through us, that we will be different than when we came in. Thank you, Father. Father, it's always such an encouragement for Donna and I to be here, to come to this precious church. And the reason it's such an encouragement is because of the love that these people have for you and how that love is seen in their love to one another. Lord, the love that they have for their pastor and his wife and the love that 
Pastor Mike and Janie have for, for this church is it's such a testimony, such a blessing. And I pray that that love for you and for one another would increase. Lord, would, uh, would continue to grow. Thank you for all the blessings that you have given each one of us. And the blessing it is to come into your presence this morning to sing with conviction. Lord, the songs we have sung, it is well with our soul. It is well because of the peace that you've given us through our Prince of Peace that even despite these uh, troubling times, Lord, the, the uncertainties, the challenges, the difficulties, the deception, Lord, the upheaval all around us, we can say it is well with our soul because we have a Savior who said, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So it's in his victory, his sovereignty, his strength, his purpose that we stand today. And as we continue our worship through the proclamation of your word to us, we pray that you would open our eyes as, as the psalmist prayed to see wonderful things in your word, that we would see Christ, that we would see his glory, that our hearts would receive that, be uplifted, be filled, and all the more ready and equipped to live the lives you have called us to live. And we pray this in his name. Amen. On its front page some time ago, USA Today once reported the results of a very interesting survey. What would you ask God if you were certain that you could get an answer? That is a fascinating question. But what is even more remarkable was the answer that people gave. By far, the majority of people chose this as the question that they would ask God. Why am I here on earth? What about you? Do you understand why you are here on earth? Do you know the purpose for your life? Jesus did. In John 17, he prays this to the Father, I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. Glorifying God by accomplishing the work the Father gave him was the purpose of Christ's life here on earth. So here's a question. Was this purpose only for Christ, or do you somehow share in that as his disciple? Well, if you turn back two chapters to John 15, Jesus gives us the answer to that question. He makes it clear what the great goal is for your life. Look at verse 8. He says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Your purpose as God's son, as God's daughter, is to glorify God. Now that sounds great, but how do you do that? How do you glorify God? Let's take a closer look at what the Lord himself says about that in John chapter 15. Let me read the first part of this chapter. And as I do that, listen carefully to what he says and see if anything stands out to you. Beginning with verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. 
As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up and they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever it wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. Such words of amazing love that Jesus speaks to us. The Lord in this passage is using a familiar word picture, familiar to the people of that day, to communicate spiritual truth. Throughout the Old Testament, Israel was pictured as a vine planted by God to be fruitful. But there was a problem with that vine. Isaiah 5, verse 2, expresses it this way. God expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. Because of Israel's unfaithfulness, that vine bore bad fruit. Now, Jesus is saying here that there is a new vine. Verse 1, Christ is the true vine that will bear good fruit. In the past, a relationship with God came through Israel, but now a relationship with God comes through Christ. And his fruit is born through the branches, which are his disciples. Now, did you notice the word that is repeated over and over in this section? It's the word abide. Yes. The Lord repeats this word ten times. The word abide means to live, to remain, to continue. Christ is saying, live in me, remain in me, continue in me. So why would Christ say this if believers are already in him? Well, this is the difference between positional reality and experiential reality. If you have trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, his righteousness is credited to your life. This is the good news of the gospel. You have been forgiven of your sins and the Lord now sees you. God the Father sees you as if you lived the perfect life of Christ. This is the positional reality of your life. Nothing can change that. Before God, you are perfectly righteous in Christ. And the Christian life is the adventure of living out that positional reality. It's growing so that your experiential reality grows closer and closer to your positional reality. That's why Christ says again and again, abide in me. God is glorified by your relationship with his son. Just like a grape branch receives its life through the grape vine, so you as a Christian receive life and fruitfulness in your relationship with Christ. You know why this is so important? Two reasons. First, a lack of spiritual fruit indicates a lack of relationship. Look again at verse 2. Jesus says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. It is taken away, verse 6, to be cast into the fire to be burned. What does that mean? Well, as you look at a vineyard, you may see a stick that's near to the grapevine along with the other branches. 
But you notice that there's no connection to that vine. So here's the question, can that stick bear fruit? No, it can't. Because it's not a branch that's attached to the vine. Jesus is saying that just being near to the vine is not the same as being connected to the vine. What Jesus is talking about is people who are next to him, so to speak, but have no true relationship with him. And so it is today. You may go to church. You may be members of your church. You may even serve in a church. But that doesn't guarantee that you are Christ's disciple, that you are connected to Christ in this way. And there's no way that spiritual fruit can come out of the life of someone like that because there is no true relationship with Christ. These people are like sticks that are next to the vine but have no connection to the vine. So how do you have a true relationship with Christ? Well, the question is this. Have you put your trust in Jesus as Lord, as Master, as ruler of your life, and as Savior. Until you do that, nothing you do in your life will matter spiritually. Sure, you can do all kinds of good things and religious things, but according to Jesus, you are still separated from him. You may try to get as close to him as you possibly can, like that stick maybe is right next to the grapevine. But it does no spiritual good. What is needed is to trust Christ completely, to forgive your sins, and to reconcile you with God. And then you will have a new life because of your true and living connection with the Lord. The second reason this truth is important is what Jesus says in verse 5. Apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. As a believer, the only way you can do anything good is by living in Christ, continuing in Christ, abiding in Christ. You can be a believer for many years. You can know lots of spiritual truth. You can be very gifted, but if you are not abiding in Christ, your life will not be fruitful. So what does it mean to abide in Christ? That's a good question. Look again at verse 7. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. Here Jesus correlates abiding with him, with his words abiding, remaining, continuing, living in you. Look at verse 10. Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Abiding in Christ, then, according to what Jesus says, means to continue in his word, to live in his word. It's living a life that's directed and empowered by his word. It's Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. It's Ephesians 5.18, being filled with the author of God's word, the Holy Spirit. And notice verse 9 gives the heart of abiding in Christ. Jesus says, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. This is staggering. Do you realize what Christ is saying here? Jesus loves you the way that God the Father loves his Son. This is a relationship of unimaginable wondrous love. So to abide in Christ is to realize this love, to rejoice in this love, to live in this love. The power of the Christian life is abiding in Christ. That energizes the priority of the Christian life, which is your love for Christ. This is the first love of the believer's life. This is the greatest commandment. 
to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And as you do that, as God's word lives in you, directing you and empowering your life, you will see God at work in your life. Verse 7, he will answer your prayers. You will bear much fruit. You will glorify your father. As a result, verse 11, Christ's joy will be in you and your joy will be full. Now, as Christ continues in John 15, there's a fascinating shift in emphasis. See if you can identify what it is beginning with verse 12. Jesus says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. This I command you, that you love one another. Did you notice the change in emphasis? Christ isn't repeating that command, abide in me any longer. Instead, there's a new phrase, a new command that he repeats. Did you see it? It's in verse 12, love one another. It's in verse 17, love one another. The shift here is from the believer's relationship with the Lord to the believer's relationship with one another. The Lord's love for you, this is marvelous. Think of this. His love for you is to so fill and overflow in your life that it affects your relationship with others. This is how you glorify God. First, in your relationship with God's Son, and second, with your relationship with God's family. Now, there are some who say they love Christ, but there is no involvement with his family. Is that possible? Well, let's allow the Lord to answer that. Remember, Later on in John, when Christ asks Peter in the last chapter this question, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. And do you remember what Jesus then said? He said, then love my sheep. Three times Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And three times Jesus says, then care for my sheep. Be involved with my sheep. Love my people. That's the answer. Love for God, true love for God, overflows in love for his children. What does this love look like? Look at verse 12 in John 15. Jesus says, as I have loved you, love one another. Loving Christ means, verse 14, doing what the Lord commands. So when the Lord tells you in his word to serve one another, to encourage one another, to bear with one another, to forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another, to regard one another as more important than yourselves, you are showing love for the Lord by obeying his commands as you love one another. That and everything else that Christ commands in our relationship with one another is what it means to glorify God. And that requires a transformation of thinking. So many times we approach opportunities in a completely wrong way. There might be some Bible study or activity or event, and, and what goes through our mind? We think, do I feel like going? Will I get something out of it? 
do I w even want to go? Instead, according to what Christ is saying here, we should be thinking, will this be an opportunity to do what Christ says, to love others? Will there be someone there who might need me to be there? Will this be an opportunity to encourage someone who needs it? So when we aren't thinking the way that we should, when God's love is not permeating our thoughts and our attitudes, what's the problem? The problem is we are not abiding in Christ. Because if we were abiding in Christ, verse 5, we would be bearing fruit, the fruit of love. So when you catch yourself thinking of your own interests instead of opportunities to love others, don't say to yourself, oh boy, I, I, I need to try harder here. I need to do better. No, say to the Lord, forgive me for not abiding in you. Restore me, cultivate, and harvest your fruit of love in me. And by doing that, verse 14, you are Christ's friend as you do what he commands. This term ties into a custom in biblical times that the kings in the Middle East had. There was a very select group of people called friends of the king. This was a group that was elevated above everyone else in the kingdom, above generals, above rulers, above noblemen, these friends had access to the king at any time. They were the ones who had the closest and most intimate relationship with the king. This is the relationship that the Lord offers you as his friend a privilege for those who do what he commands. It's the privilege, verse 15, of knowing what the master is doing, knowing what his purpose is, his great purpose for this world. Christ wants you, think of it. Christ wants you to partner with him in what he is doing in this world, bringing glory to the Father. That is why Christ has chosen you to bear fruit, lasting fruit, that will remain throughout eternity. And you have all of God's authority to accomplish that. Verse 16, Christ says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. There's purpose. There's your purpose. You've been appointed. Why? So that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. Wow. This puts a completely different perspective on prayer. So many times we think of prayer as, well, kind of like an intercom in a mansion, you know, and, and if we need some extra cushions or if we need some snacks, you know, that would be kind of nice, then we can we can access that intercom and, and, and ask for that. But that's not what Jesus is saying here. Prayer is not an intercom in a mansion. It is a walkie-talkie on the battlefield to call in air support for victory in spiritual warfare. And when it is hard to love someone, and, and at times it will be hard, when it is challenging to forgive, when it is difficult to overcome evil with good, when you are discouraged, when you are weak, all you need to do is pick up that walkie-talkie. All you need to do is to ask, and the Lord promises that He will give you all that you need to accomplish His purpose for you. Now, here's what's fascinating. These two priorities of loving Christ and loving one another are synergistic. They have an amazing effect on one another. When you love God with all your heart, that love will overflow into love for one another. This is one of the ways that we love God. And our relationships 
with one another should fortify and strengthen and encourage our love for God, right? That is how you can tell if your love is genuine. If your love for God motivates you, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, the love of Christ compels us. If it compels you to love one another, then that's true love. And if your relationships with others result in greater love for God, then that is true fellowship. That is true love for one another. And guess what? To love in this way, to love as Christ loved, <laughs> is impossible. You and I simply don't have the ability to love this way. You might have good intentions, you might give it lots of effort, but it won't happen. Verse 5, apart from Jesus, you and I can do nothing. That's why we need to abide in Christ for that. We need to let His Word and His Spirit fill us and empower us to love in this way. There's one more priority, one more purpose in this chapter, one more key way to glorify God. As Jesus continues, He reveals that what that is, starting with verse 18. He says, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned, but now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They have hated me without cause. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the father, that is the spirit of truth, who proceeds from the father, he will testify about me and you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. There are two key words repeated in this passage. The first is the word world. World. The, the emphasis in this section of John 15 is your relationship with the world. And like your relationship with God's Son and your relationship with God's family, this is a challenge that goes beyond your strength and ability. One of those challenges is the world's opposition, verse 18. The way this verse appears in the English might give the impression that this may or may not happen if the world hates you. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But that's not the case. Jesus makes it clear that the world system under the rule of Satan hates him. In the Greek language, this verb is in the perfect tense, implying that this is a fixed attitude of hatred and hostility. This is the reason the world hates Christ's disciples, because it hates Christ. So don't be surprised when the world gives you a difficult time, when it hates you, because verse 19, you are no longer of this world. Christ chose you and redeemed you out of it. In fact, you and I need to expect opposition and mistreatment from the world because verse 20, the world opposed and persecuted Christ. And so verse 21, any mistreatment, any persecution you receive is because of Christ. So in light of this wickedness, this rejection, this hatred. You might expect Christ at this point to pronounce judgment and condemnation, but he doesn't. Instead, 
Beginning with verse 26, he says, I'm sending the Helper, the Holy Spirit, and he will testify about me. This is amazing. How does Christ respond to an unbelieving, stubborn, hostile, hating world? He responds with grace, with love. Jesus says he will send his spirit from the Father to testify, to bring the good news of Christ and his salvation to the world. And that is the second key word in this passage that is repeated, that word testify. This is the third priority of Christ in this chapter, the priority of your relationship with the world. Verse 27, you will testify also because you have been with me from the beginning. The Spirit works through you as you abide in Christ, filling you and empowering you to testify about Christ. This is important because the temptation is to stop at these first two priorities, your relationship with God and your relationship with his family, and to subtly retreat into isolation. Some have actually done that in church history, retreating into monasteries, retreating into caves, isolating themselves from the world. Some Christians today isolate themselves from any meaningful contact with unbelievers. But the Lord says, no, this is my priority. This is my purpose for you to testify about me to the world. That is what evangelism is. It's not about gimmicks or techniques or methods or having an outgoing personality. No, evangelism is simply accurately and faithfully testifying about Christ, who he is, and what he has done. Evangelism is abiding in Christ so that God's Spirit fills and empowers you to do this. This relationship the world, with the world is also connected with the first two relationships. It's synergistic. It's fascinating. In John 15, 10, Christ says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And one of Christ's commandments is to testify about him. So your relationship with God's son connects to your relationship with God's world. And remember what Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So your relationship with God's family also connects you to your relationship with God's world. And what happens when you testify about Christ? Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So your relationship with God's world is connected to your relationship with God's Son as He brings glory to God the Father. The result is the lost coming into God's family and even more opportunities to love one another, even more opportunities to glorify God. So all three of these relationships, your relationship with God's Son, your relationship with God's family, and your relationship with God's world. All three are interconnected in a marvelous synergy. What does this tell you about the heart of God? That His purpose, these three great priorities, all have to do with relationships. And you might have noticed on your outline that the first letter in each priority forms a word, aim. That's a helpful way to remember your aim, your purpose. Your purpose in life is to glorify God through adoration of God's Son, involvement with God's family, and mission to God's world. This is God's glorious purpose for you. 
a, a blessing for yourself and for others. And the more you are living in line with these three priorities, the more you will experience what Jesus says in verse 11, the joy of the Lord himself, joy that will fill your life as you live in fruitfulness to the glory of God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your word, your marvelous word, showing us what a God of glory and grace you are, calling us into this astounding relationship with you through Christ, overflowing into a relationship with your family and your word, your world. Oh, Lord, we cry out for your grace so that we may live lives of meaning and impact, lives of purpose, your great purpose for us, bearing much fruit. May the fulfillment of these three priorities in our lives be for your glory and for our joy. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue our worship through the singing of a, a song of response, it's an opportunity for you to, to come forward and, and receive prayer for, for any matter. It could be what we've talked about this morning. It could be any other issue. I will be off to the side. And uh, we just want to give you that opportunity as a church that, that loves you. So let's, let's sing together. Please stand. Never tire of thanking you for your faithful giving for the Lord's work at and through FSCC. Thanks. Please always complete a Connect card whether here in person or online. 
Come pray in person, or put Zoom on your Connect card to receive the weekly link. There is Bible study for all ages at 9 a.m. on Sundays. Help is still needed for nursery preschool volunteers to enable a monthly rotation. Tell Debbie Peak if you can help. Are you involved in Bible study? If not, you are really really missing out. Fun after school time for kids starts soon. Please sign up for the weeks you can help. Men's breakfast is this Saturday at 8 a.m. at Sterling Cafe. Mark your calendar for our quarterly potluck and business meeting on October 17. Invite postcards are on the back table. Please keep inviting others. Thanks. Let's stand for our benediction. I love this benediction from God's word. It's from Romans 15. It's God's blessing upon you this day. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus so that with one heart and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and all God's people said amen, amen. God bless you